through Germany, that's also May 26. So what we've got is the United States lashing out uh, in uh, at least three directions towards Iran and uh, in the Middle East more generally towards um, China, towards Russia. Um, I guess we, we, we have the endless grumble about stuff going on in relation to Ukraine and so on and so forth. So the United States lashing out, that's step one. Step two, the context of this United States lashing out is um, continued ascendancy and growth of um, right-wing nationalism as a politics. As far as I can see, actually, the, the turn in this direction towards uh, right-wing nationalism and away from um, proper neoliberalism proper is something which uh, takes place uh, at diff in different places at different times. But uh, in Russia, uh, the election of Putin uh, represents a sharp turn away from uh, the policy of friendliness with the United States in 1999. Um, in uh, uh, Poland, uh, the Law and Justice Party moved uh, sharply to the right away from neoliberalism and towards nationalism when it was in opposition after 2007. Uh, Orban uh, in Hungary was a straight neoliberal uh, again, but in the early 2000s became a, uh, a nationalist. Uh, the uh, Modi administration was created in its present form in, 20, in India in 2014. Um, uh, Erdogan, prime minister in 2003, seems to have turned towards nationalist authoritarianism as opposed to quite neoliberal versions of Islamism uh, in uh, around 2012-2013 and so on. Um, so this is, uh, of course, more recently we've had uh, the victory of the Brexiteers first in the referendum, then in uh, the fight in the Tory party about the terms on which uh, Brexit should happen. Uh, the victory of the Trump administration in the United States over the uh, uh, Trump versus Clinton over the uh, classic neoliberal centre-right uh, Democrats. Um, and of course, uh, in uh, Italy, the uh, uh, victory of the uh, uh, <coughs> the leg and the far right and indeed uh, while we currently have in Italy a um, center slash te technocratic government the polls are showing uh, the leg a long way ahead uh, in for the next uh, Italian election. Mm -hmm. This is not unique um, the uh, Macron administration is, uh, the Macron party is uh, breaking up. Surprise, surprise, it was never more than a, uh, fig a, a structure to back up Macron as a, uh, a Bonaparte. Uh, and uh, where we can expect that to go from the polls is that the next prime minister will probably be Martine Le Pen, Marine Le Pen. Uh, uh, the next president of France will probably be Marine Le Pen. Um, there's no sign, you know, the, the, the left parties in France are, are way, way, way down the scale, uh, with the highest being the Mélenchon um, uh, Parti Front de Gauche at uh, uh, France Insoumise, sorry, uh, at around 11, 12 percent. Yeah. So this general tendency um, uh, uh, towards uh, right-wing nationalism. Where's it come from? The short answer is where the tendency towards right-wing nationalism comes from is from the untruth of the claims of neoliberalism and not just of neoliberalism but the untruth, the basic untruth of the claims of um, the uh, 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 marginalist economics. The consequence of the untruth of the claims about marginalist economics is there is no great moderation. There is no the the the, 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 cyclic, the recyclical return of financial crisis is endogenous to 
the regime. Uh, and in fact, uh, in uh, the, the kicker for the beginning of this shift into right-wing nationalism was not the crash of 2008, it was the crisis, long-term capital management crisis uh, of 1998 and the East Asian crisis of the same year, and then the dot-com crash of uh, 2001, which among other things wiped out the Hungarian economy, which had become desperately enmeshed in uh, borrowing uh, in foreign currencies and uh, thereby uh, acute um, damage was done uh, when the uh, crashes came, took place in 98 and 2001, setting the seal for Orban, who was a neoliberal in the 1990s, to become a nationalist populist, and similarly for law and justice, who came out of neoliberal commitments, uh, Christian democratic commitments to be in Poland to become nationalist populists in the, in, in the mid 2000s. So this dynamic yeah, uh, is one uh, which goes along with, predates, it's not a product of the immediate past, yeah. it's a product of uh, the false prospectus offered by neoliberalism and free market economics from the 1990s and the fact that that prospectus proved to be false through the uh, economic crises uh, beginning uh, with uh, 1998. Of course in a certain sense crashes begin, uh, crashes begin earlier but the return to visible crashes and visible economic, radical economic consequences of visible crashes begins in effect with the uh, uh, LTCM and East Asian crises of 1998. And the first response to the LTCM East Asian crisis of 1998 is to the left. It's the uh, anti-globalization movement, social forums movement, um, around about the, uh, the, the turn of the century. But the social forums movement demonstrates itself inability to uh, get out of the frameworks of neoliberalism and out of the frameworks of bureaucratic management. That's visible in um, what happens to the Brazilian Workers' Party. It's visible in uh, what happens to Rifondazione Comunista in Italy. And that loss of direction, of uh, sense of any project, any serious alternative project, um, yields uh, post-2008 crisis, we get um, kickoffs for, it takes a little while for the consequences of the crisis to feed through, but we get uh, uh, it's kicking off, we get uh, street demonstrations, but we don't get anything even as strong as the um, uh, anti-globalization movement and social forums yeah. so that the dominant response to the failure of neoliberalism and it's already beginning to be the dominant response to the failure of neoliberalism with uh, the election of Putin yeah, uh, is uh, the shift to the nationalist right. Why, if we think about this carefully, why should this be the case and why should it be the case and I think we're going to see more of it very sharp uptick escalation further of this uh, in response to uh, the uh, coronavirus crisis. Because, because in essence, what governments have done in response to the coronavirus crisis is to crash the economy, but not to do what's necessary in order to get out of a crash of the economy, which is to make the losses fall on um, lenders particularly to make the losses fall on landlords, to make the losses fall on uh, creditor interest, to make the losses fall on pensioners, therefore, and on uh, savers and strivers, aspirers who have piled into um, uh, investments of one sort or another. And the consequence of doing that, which is most acute and most clear with the COVID-19, but was already clear with the 2008 crash, is that the state plays a bigger role unavoidably 
the state plays a bigger role in managing the economy. And the consequence of the state playing a bigger role in managing the economy, in managing immediate problems, is that the state builds up nationalism around itself. That solidarity, the idea of solidarity, inevitably comes to be expressed in the form of solidarity. We're all in it together. We Brits are all in it together. Perhaps north of the border, they're saying we Scots are in it together, but not so much with the English. Um, certainly, we English are all in it together. Um, and the consequence of uh, we're all in it together is unavoidably the consequence of this uh, this 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 uh, turn is unavoidably a geopolitical conflict. We can see it very clearly again in the European Union. It is quite likely that the European Union will break up, or at least that the eurozone will break up in the next year. The British government, of course, is sedulously promoting the idea that the European Union will break up in the next year because that will help. But it's reasonably clear that it's exactly the same thing. As soon as you get a crash of this sort, the choice has to be faced between radical redistribution against creditors, savers, pensioners and uh, landlords yeah. and radical redistribution in favour of them. Because if you don't cancel debt, if you don't cancel rent liabilities, what you will get uh, is uh, collapsing small businesses and quite a lot of large businesses. And uh, uh, people who happen to be cash rich or happen to have crony relationships with bits of government are able to pick up assets on the cheap. And uh, the uh, middle classes and the upper part of the working classes are impoverished. Um, and then the paradox of this, it isn't the case, it is not true that um, economic crisis is driven in the first place by austerity regimes and uh, underconsumption. That's not true because underconsumption is a standing phenomenon which has existed for millennia. Economic crises, recurrent economic crises started in um, 1763 or thereabouts as a, as a recurrent phenomenon which keeps coming back and uh, uh, with, uh, with a considerable degree of regularity. But it is true, on the other hand, that if you try and get out of the economic crisis by dumping the losses on uh, the relatively poor and uh, particularly on the, on, on the working class, profitability will rise in the sense that the rate of exploitation rises, but unfortunately, uh, firms, because there's a contracting market, end market for uh, the products, firms will be driven to cash the gains which they make at the expense of the working class in the form of uh, lower prices. Mm -hmm. With the result that you get a cycle of deflation. And the, objectively the only way out of this mm -hmm. is events uh, which will cause a crash of uh, capital asset values. The losses have to fall on creditors, the losses have to fall on capital asset values. That can happen either by states in general knifing their um, con major contributors to political parties and knifing the uh, lenders who lend to them and imposing uh, default on these lenders or a haircut as it's sometimes called on these lenders as happened in 1720 with the crash of uh, the South Sea Company. You know, the government simply said, legislated, you can't recover more than two thirds of any debt contracted in the preceding five years. You know, uh, it artificially deflate or alternatively, it has to take the form of war leading to state defaults. It was not Keynesian measures which got Europe out and the world out of the depression it was the combination of war, but also in particular the fact that uh, something in between half and two thirds of all uh, uh, public debts were defaulted in the aftermath of 
globally were defaulted in the aftermath of the war. The sheer scale of defaults uh, in 1946-48 clears off. Plus, of course, the fact that the United Kingdom had to hand over a lot of assets to the United States clears off the inflated creditor claims. So the drive, it is not, <coughs> it does it not at present, uh, as it was in uh, spring summer 19, in spring summer 1914, autumn 1914, politicians in Britain, in France, in Germany, in Austria, in Russia, were all thinking uh, it would be a good idea to have a nice sh short victorious war and get us out of the shit which we're in in Britain with the Irish question. Uh, in France with syndicalists, in Germany, the SPD uh, was uh, planning a general strike to enforce universal suffrage uh, and had been stockpiling money and assets for that purpose. Um, in Russia, the uh, 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 workers' movement had revived over 1912-1914 and they, for all of these people, they were at the edge of the right, war is the way out of this. That's not what's happening now. We're not at the immediate moment that Trump is in danger of falling at this massively strong workers' movement, that uh, uh, war is the way out of this. It's that the objective need of the economy for war leading to large-scale state defaults, plus the extent to which the... Um, crises, crashes, delegitimize the free market. And because they delegitimize the free market in the absence of a strong workers movement, in the absence of a strong left, which poses a strategic alternative, the collectivism which is objectively needed necessarily takes the form of statist collectivism, necessarily takes the form of nationalism. And because it necessarily takes the form of right-wing statist nationalism uh, and uh, the policeman as the uh, 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 figure of the man on horseback as the uh, figure of politics, it drives towards war. It doesn't drive towards war out of anybody's particular voluntary choices. I'm sure that there are people who advocate voluntary choice of making war, particularly actually of making war, US making war on Iran. This looks like it's revenge for 1979-81. It's also, uh, hey, it's a soft target because we can beat the shit out of these people and they can't hit back that, that effectively, is the idea. Um, but the underlying drive towards war uh, is one which is created by the dynamics of the economy. And uh, if it doesn't sh show up in the Middle East, it will show up somewhere else, perhaps, um, as I say, uh, 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 the South China Sea or uh, whatever. Uh, that's it. Hey. Okay, hello. Uh, yes, thank you, Mike. Um, I don't know whether Vernon's got people on Facebook yet, um, but uh, I think so, it's streaming. Um, if people are on Facebook, if they can make comments, uh, they can be passed on to the speakers here in the chat column. Uh, Moshe, um, Moshe Makaba going to speak about the uh, latest developments, a, a glorious chapter in the history of Zionism. Okay, Moshe. Yes, thank you. Actually, what I'm going to say to Rick is some sense with what uh, Mike has just uh, said. Um, war, I think, you know, one of the, one of the likely uh, places where uh, or f uh, focus points of, of war, danger of war is uh, in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis Iran and of course uh, Netanyahu uh, he is one of the uh, most ardent uh, uh, supporters and uh, who urged the uh, United States to take uh, uh, warlike action against Iran. Um, the title of my talk actually is a quote from um, 
Netanyahu's speech in the Israeli parliament on, uh, actually, uh, what was it, three weeks ago, two weeks, sorry, two weeks ago on the 17th of this month when he was uh, presenting his uh, uh, finally constructed cabinet uh, to the Israeli Knesset. Um, after three rounds of elections, which he instigated just in order to keep out of jail, uh, he finally managed uh, uh, to do it. Um, I mean, uh, uh, what he said was that, that on the 1st of July, they are going to take st uh, steps towards annexation of uh, fairly large areas of the West Bank to Israel, the uh, Israeli settlements, uh, and mainly the, the uh, big area alongside the Jordan, the Jordan Valley. Uh, apart from the glorious part, he says, this is going to be another glorious part in the history of Zionism. Uh, glorious apart, this is accurate. It is another chapter in the history of Zionism. Zionism is uh, about, the, the Zionist project is about colonization of Palestine. And this is just the next uh, upcoming stage in, in, in this process. Um, whether he is actually going to enact uh, annexation uh, uh, in the full sense of the word is a, a moot question. Some people say that it, it, what, is, what is going to happen is not quite. It, it is uh, um, possibly just, and I think, you know, this is the most likely, a sort of enabling act uh, to uh, um, ratify the so-called deal of the century uh, that was uh, proposed finally by Trump. Uh, and in this sense, what I'm saying today is, is a continuation of what I said in the last meeting of this forum, the Hopi meeting on the 9th of February. This, this was just shortly after the, the publication of the um, uh, Trump uh, deal of the century, which was qualified as the, you know, as a, 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 a the, uh, by a, a, an, Israel, an Israeli uh, uh, establishment figure um, as, as uh, the longest uh, uh, letter of, of contempt for the, for the uh, uh, Palestinian uh, people. Uh, so many hundred pages of uh, contempt. Uh, Palestinians are not meant to accept this deal in any way. Whether he is going, how far he is going to, to go right now depends on many factors, uh, mainly on the uh, shorter needs of Trump who is uh, facing an election year uh, soon, and of himself, uh, uh, his, his long-standing uh, fight to keep out of jail. I would like to show you, I mean, uh, 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 exactly a week ago, uh, he uh, presented himself in the Jerusalem District Court, and finally, his uh, uh, trial, uh, on several charges of corruption and uh, related uh, bribery and, and so on uh, uh, was beginning. And I, I would like to show you how he presented himself at the uh, uh, district court in Jerusalem. I'll share my screen with you. Can you see? Can everyone see? Yeah, we can yeah. see. Okay, so this this is Netanyahu accompanied by his uh, close uh, uh, colleagues, you know, in the in the government, the, the Likud uh, part of the Israeli uh, new Israeli cabinet. He was coming to uh, for the first hearing of his trial, and th this is you know look at look at this sort of mafia picture. Uh, 
uh, uh, he, he made a, a, a speech condemning the Israeli legal system as uh, uh, motivated by a left-wing plot against him to uh, uh, unseat him. Of course, uh, uh, the, the main, main target are the, the, the judges and the attorney, attorney general who submitted the, the indictment against him, um, who was, of course, his own appointee. <laughs> but uh, now he's, he's enemy num number one. So you see, this is this is how he present how the, the accused presents himself uh, for the, the first hearing on uh, in the trial against him for bribery. Okay. Uh, how do I stop here? Okay. Here, here we are. Uh, so to what extent? To how far he will go in this annexation? Uh, whether it's just an enabling act or a full-fledged full annexation depends on his immediate needs and on uh, uh, Trump's needs. By the way, a, a few days before the 1st of July, in the latter part of, of June, there is going to be a, a big uh, uh, conference of CUFI, C-U-F-I, Christians United for Israel. This is a, a large, the largest evangelical uh, organization in the United States, by far the largest uh, uh, part of the Israeli lobby in the United States. Uh, and um, uh, I think that in order to please them, uh, Trump may actually uh, uh, provide the, the necessary green light for annexation. This is, this, this is what they are, by the way, uh, evangelicals are uh, uh, reckoned to be about a quarter of the American, the United States electorate. So it's not, it's not just a, a, a small group of, of crazies. It's, it's a huge part of the American electorate and, and Trump's success in the upcoming election depends on pleasing them to a very large extent. So this is not a, a minor consideration. Uh, this apart, you see, the, the, the uh, act of annexation, whether it's going to happen right now or, or a bit later, is an inevitable uh, uh, stage uh, in the process of Zionist colonization. Uh, unless it's you know, uh, going to be stopped by some revolution in, in uh, uh, the whole area, or of a big change in the world capitalist system for you know, towards socialism, but don't hold your breath. Um, so this is this is what is what is coming. Uh, a, a large swathe of land along the River Jordan is going to be annexed. Uh, now uh, there are not many Palestinians living there. Uh, the uh, estimated number is about fifty thousand. Now that is that is uh, uh, compared to about uh, in in the order, or let's say, of two million Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, Netanyahu made clear that these people are not going to get Israeli citizenship when the, this area is annexed to Israel. Uh, the Palestinian inhabitants are not going to uh, be awarded Israeli citizens. I will come to this point later because it's very important in order to understand the, the, the meaning of this annexation. Now, some people, uh, people, people more or less on our side, have, have uh, dismissed this annexation thing as of no real significance. What's the difference? Israel, in any case, is in control of the West Bank, is behaving there as the de facto ruler. It is, this is part of, of the uh, area controlled by Israel. I think this is a very big mistake, very big mistake. It's going to make a huge uh, uh, difference, uh, first of all, to uh, the uh, question of land grab. Uh, the, uh, immediate, almost immediate consequence of annexation will be a huge, uh, large-scale robbery of land. The, the area along the Jordan, the Jordan Valley, is 
possibly the most fertile uh, uh, part of the West Bank, and of the whole of Palestine, by the way. Um, it is hugely fertile. Um, and this is why the settlers are eyeing it, you know, with the, 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 they are salivating uh, in, in expectation of the land that they are going to uh, obtain. So, uh, although it is not a densely populated area because it's a rural part of the West Bank, it's mostly agricultural. Very few, I mean, there are no, no big towns there. Uh, and this is, by the way, the reason Israel is, is so keen to annex it land without too many people. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the difference is going to make is that. Uh, Israel is going to apply the legal system concerning uh, uh, land ownership that, uh, that obtains in Israel itself. Until now, in the West Bank, uh, Israel has uh, more or less abided by international norms, not formally following the Geneva Conventions, but accepting the, the essence of the Geneva Conventions as far as uh, land ownership is concerned. And so it has been very, uh, let us say, uh, self-limiting in, in terms of how much land it, 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 it can uh, 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 put its hands on to uh, uh, swallow in order to uh, facilitate Israeli settlements. Um, it was mostly uh, state lands, not private land. Private lands, uh, on the whole, were protected to a great extent against the uh, 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 land robbery by, by Israel. Not entirely, because Israel found all sorts of ways around it, but in principle, at least, it, it abided by the principle that, that uh, uh, private land cannot be uh, uh, taken from private uh, 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 farmers for uh, Israeli settlements. All this is going to disappear if the, the moment this, is, uh, uh, this area is next to Israel, because from the 1950s, Israel has elaborated the whole system, the whole legal system of uh, legal instruments whereby uh, Palestinian uh, land, uh, in the first instance, in the 1950s, it was those Palestinians who e evaded or escaped uh, ethnic cleansing in the 1948 war their land was systematically taken away from them. The, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, some two million Palestinian uh, uh, inhabitants or citizens of Israel uh, in its pre-1967 war had, had remained without any, uh, uh, hardly any agricultural land because it was uh, uh, robbed by, from them by uh, various legal uh, instruments that Israel legislated uh, uh, right from the 1950s. This is going to be applied in the Jordan Valley. So about a quarter of the land of that, of that area, which itself is about a, a quarter of the remaining of the, of the West Bank total, is going to be very quickly uh, uh, robbed from, from its, its owners. Plus, uh, it's going now to complete the, the uh, surrounding the whole of the, the core of the West Bank from the east. So far, the, the West Bank is, is surrounded on, the, on, its, on its west by the separation wall. But it, is, it, has, it has a contiguous uh, contact with the Transjordan, with the, the Kingdom of Jordan across the river. Um, and uh, uh, moreover, and uh, this, this, of course, is going to be taken away. So the, the, the Palestinian population in the urban centers of the West Bank, the, the densely populated, will be completely surrounded by Israeli territory, uh, official Israeli territory. Um, so it, in order to visit their relatives across the Jordan, in the Kingdom of Jordan, they will have to pass through Israeli uh, territory, what will become Israeli territory. Plus, the main roads from uh, uh, along the, the West Bank, north, north, east, north, south roads, are now going to be in Israeli territory. 
So in order for Palestinians to move from one part of the uh, West Bank to another, from south to north or vice versa, they, they would have to go into Israeli territory, which would make it much more difficult. It's difficult enough today with all the, the checkpoints and so on, but this will make it uh, much more difficult. Plus, the only urban center which is uh, near the Jordan Valley, uh, the uh, uh, Jericho, the, the area of Jericho, Jericho, the, the oldest city in the world, supposed to be, um, uh, this is going to be a pocket. This is not going, uh, not part of the, the uh, uh, annexable territory according to the Trump uh, uh, deal of the century. So this will remain Palestinian uh, administered territory, not part of Israel, but it will be an enclave completely surrounded by Israeli territory. Uh, in order to, for people from Jericho to travel to, let us say, to, to uh, uh, Hebron, which is not far away, they would have to pass through Israeli territory, which would be very difficult, and so on and so and so on. Um, so uh, uh, pe people like, uh, you know, I heard uh, Tony Greenstein say, what's the difference? Israel is co in control anyway. So it will now formalize an existing situation. No, not at all. Plus, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, declaration that these 50,000 Palestinians will not get Israeli citizenship is very yes, clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you please mute your audio? Well, I've, I've had here, here uh, uh, Yeah, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's going to, to make a, a hell of a difference. Plus, uh, the, the uh, uh, fact that these people are not going to get uh, Israeli citizenship is, is ominous because what it denotes is that the plan is to ethnically cleanse them. If they got Israeli citizenship, it would be much more difficult to ethnically cleanse them. You can't expel your own citizens. I mean, this, this would be very, uh, 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 very much against international law. Uh, but if, if they are foreigners uh, uh, who happen to just be there in, in Israeli territory, it would, it would be much, much more uh, difficult, much, much easier to uh, ethnically cleanse them. And this is in fact uh, what Israel plans to do in any forthcoming uh, stage of further annexation. The uh, idea is to uh, uh, ethnically cleanse as far as possible any uh, Palestinian uh, um, remaining in these uh, uh, annexed territories. Um, in order to uh, uh, do ethnic cleansing in the more densely populated areas, Israel will uh, uh, benefit from a war situation in, in the Middle East. This is not just a, a speculation, this, this is a known plan uh, which has been published. I, I refer to it in my last talk on, on the 9th of uh, February, I don't want to repeat myself, but th there is a long-standing plan of using uh, uh, configuration in, in, in the Middle East um, to uh, e exploit it in order to uh, uh, ethnically cleanse large number of Palestinians where to and this is this is where it's getting interesting because the fall guy of these plans is the Kingdom of Jordan. This is uh, why the uh, Abdallah II King of Jordan is getting very worried and is making all sorts of noises about Israel's plan because um, Jordan is going to be the fall guy. Israel will uh, uh, no doubt get support from uh, the leading uh, Sunni uh, uh, power in the, in, the, in, in the Arab world, uh, that's to say uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, um, I speculate that the price of uh, Saudi support for ethnically uh, cleansing the Palestinians from the West Bank will be awarding uh, uh, the Saudi 
uh, royal house the custodianship of the holy place in Jerusalem. You see that the, the Hashemite dynasty, whose remaining uh, scion is the uh, king of uh, Jordan, used to be the custodian of all three holy places of Islam, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. Uh, in the 1920s, the House of Saud uh, got hold, con conquered, uh, actually di di dis uh, displaced the Hashemites from Mecca and Medina, but they remained custodian. Even under Israeli occupation, there is an arrangement whereby the Jordanian king appoints the clergy and so on uh, of uh, the holy place in Jerusalem, Temple Mount. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Jordanian king is, is rightly worried that uh, this, will going to, this is going to uh, uh, terminate uh, once uh, 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 Jordan is, uh, will be designated as the new Palestine. This is, this is the, the part of the so-called Sharon plan ethnically cleanse the Palestinians from the West Bank across the Jordan and declare the Eastern, uh, what used to be Transjordan and is now the Kingdom of Jordan, this is the, going to be the Palestinian state. The whole of Palestine uh, west of the Jordan uh, will, will be uh, uh, Zionized, will be uh, colonized by Zionism. This will uh, complete the uh, project of colonization of Palestine. So this is uh, uh, why, uh, uh, part of the reason why Netanyahu is so keen to uh, uh, provoke uh, war against uh, Iran. Of course, Israel is not going to go on its own against Iran. This, this would be madness. Uh, but uh, it, it, it is provoking the United States to go and, and uh, uh, fight a war against Iran under which a smoke screen, Israel will be able to perpetrate a new Nakba. That's it. Thank you, Moshe. Um, uh, yes, I just got uh, confirmation that the Facebook streaming is working and uh, for the comrades uh, watching on Facebook, uh, you can make chat comments and they'll be transferred and uh, put into the chat comment of the Zoom meeting for the speakers to or other comrades to uh, answer your points if they wish to. Um, so, uh, go on to Yasmin now about the danger of another horrendous war. Yasmin. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I want to start. Hold on. Is my audio very loud? Okay, I want to start by talking about um, Iran's foreign policy, because in some ways there is another party to the escalation of conflict in the region and Iran's Islamic Republic is the other party. Having said that, it certainly is the, if you like, the much, much weaker uh, force there. This is a country on its knees because of years of sanctions, especially the last three years under Donald Trump. It's also, um, sorry, can you hear me? No? Yes, we can, yes. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, so this is a country that um, has faced a lot of problems because of the current uh, sanctions, but also um, because it, is, uh, it was one of the first countries facing coronavirus and therefore um, had a lot of problems with that and asked for the relaxation of sanctions during that period and that didn't happen. And as a result of that problem, I think um, it became even more vulnerable in some ways. However, um, a lot of the so-called um, Iranian opposition do try and um, argue that th these are the ones who are not for regime change, I should add. They argue that Iran should take a more reasonable position. 
And what they mean by a more reasonable position is that uh, Iran's Islamic Republic should try and moderate its policies in uh, the region towards um, the Palestinian question regarding Israel and so on. My argument is that over the last 40 years, the Iranian government has done as much as it can um, to uh, try and uh, ingratiate itself with the United States. It's precisely the United States that doesn't want this. I might refer to revenge. There's elements of that. There's an element of teaching other countries that you can't even pretend to be independent, even if you are financially totally dependent. Um, and that takes me to Iran's foreign policy. Iran's foreign policy, I say, I would say, has three main aspects to it. On the one hand, uh, is what I would call the rituals, um, only believed by very few, mainly by all the Ayatollahs, such as Khamenei himself, the supreme leader, and a few people around him who uh, still have these notions that they are supporting the Palestinians. They regularly shout this to the US, this to Israel. In practice, what that has meant for Palestine is very limited, in my opinion. Uh, the help for Hezbollah has been more um, historic and more clear. Uh, the help for the Palestinian movement is a very uh, direct to very particular groups. Uh, conflict with Hamas has meant that at times it hasn't even supported Islamic groups in the Palestinian movement. At times it has supported Hamas. Uh, why do I say these are rhetorics? Because the sons and daughters of these very same clerics um, are actually uh, very much westernized. They live in the West. They have no time for um, uh, anti-Israel or anti-US, more importantly, anti-US slogans. You can see how they flaunt their wealth here and there, and it's very brand-orientated, US-orientated. So really, even amongst the younger generation of the Islamic movement of the revolution of 1979, so there's very few people who believe that rhetoric. Then there is the category of necessities. The necessities include Lebanon and Syria, and that's because um, uh, uh, Iran does face a very clear US-Saudi-Israeli alliance. And that alliance um, is, a, is really a dangerous enemy. Saudi Arabia, some of the other Persian Gulf countries were involved uh, in uh, supporting, financing various um, jihadi organizations, those organizations such as Daesh, their declared aim was the overthrow of Iran's Islamic Republic. So Iran might be paranoid, but there are very good reasons for it to be paranoid. In that way, you could say that um, there are necessities for Iran to get involved, or at least to consider a level of defensive areas in Lebanon and Syria um, as a uh, as if you like, the, the way to stop attacks against Iran. And then there is the, the latter part, which is picked up by some, I would case, call social imperialist organizations, social, social imperialist organizations, and that's its expansionism. Again, I would say that Iran's expansionism is more rhetoric than practical steps. Iran doesn't take um, any um, action about this. It does try, but it's given its economic um, problems and given the fact that it can't even buy fuel for its aeroplanes in European airports, never mind um, worldwide, um, or, the, or uh, in, in, a, in the American continent, uh, shows that this is not a country that is able to expand um, it's um, Islamic rhetoric or expansionist re rhetoric, as it's been called by some people. Um, Iran's economy is in a terrible situation. As I said, this predates the coronavirus, but um, more recently we've had the president and various other people warning everyone, as they do in every other country, that the economy will take a very long time to recover. 
for Iranians, that must be a joke because recovery to pre-corona era uh, was still living under um, pretty harsh conditions for the majority living under the line of poverty declared by the state itself. Uh, Iran's economy is so much hit by sanctions that uh, last week, for example, it had to send five tankers full of oil to Venezuela to be paid in gold. This is to bypass the sanctions. And it really um, exemplifies the kind of problems the, the country is facing, again, with both with the collapse of the price of oil before and after Corona, but also in general, in terms of what it faces um, economically. There are many protests in Iran and many Iranians, if you are looking from inside Iran, would tell you that their own government is as much of an enemy as the United States. Um, the problem is that they are actually interlinked because the fear of war, the threat of war, this, the, uh, idea of uh, looking for, um, ag um, for conflict and crisis is the regime's way of getting away from answering basic um, demands uh, such as workers' protests against privatization. Even last week we had HEPCO workers um, staging major demonstrations against closure of factories privatizations that the Supreme Leader supports, privatizations that the various factions of the reformist uh, government have supported. Uh, together with this um, a major protest by the urban poor um, against the abolition of subsidies in November 2019, uh, we still don't know how many people died there, although the minister tells us that uh, the Minister for Interior is now telling this week that it was 200. Why it took some, so many months to actually count how many people died in those protests is another matter. But like every other country that has followed the diktat of the IMF and the World Bank, uh, the abolition of subsidies was part of an agreement that Iran had signed with these international organizations. Not that the state is um, in favor of, uh, the current state is in favor of subsidies. Subsidies were what had remained from a very long time ago, some of them since the Iran Iraq war, where the, the government was relying on popular support for its, for its survival. So, as I've said before, faced with so many economic problems at a time when the estimation is that 6.4 million Iranians will become unemployed um, after and during the corona crisis, at a time when most people have two or three jobs to survive, most of them very low paid jobs to survive, uh, the government does need crisis, but it does not need, want war. And that's why we constantly see skirmishes uh, not just in Syria, where conflict does um, occur, and the Israelis are very keen to make sure that any base where Iran has um, an influence or has forces in there or has military equipment there is um, bombed, um, destroyed if possible. But also, uh, we see this in terms of uh, the way the Iranian government um, tries to go on with the slogan about Israel. Um, it, it has had the reverse effect. Why has it had the reverse effect? Because the younger population don't believe anything the government says or oppose everything the government says. As a result of this, the majority of the population under the Islamic Republic are not supporters of the Palestinian movement, something that my generation and generations after me, who considered themselves anti-imperialist, left-wing, or, or at least anti-imperialist, were considering to be a major part of our identity. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, uh, as far as the threat of war is concerned, that hasn't subsided. Uh, there are many reasons. I think both Saudi Arabia and Israel consider Iran more a rival than an enemy. 
and its destruction is necessary in order to make sure that uh, they prosper. In that way, I think we often see a very, um, a very practical steps towards increasing levels of conflict. These practical steps in terms of Saudi Arabia has, have manifested in self, it, itself, not just in the political propaganda that Saudi um, broadcasting has heavily invested in, but in terms of financing jihadist um, uh, Salafi groups. In terms of Israel, uh, it is uh, very direct. It, it does involve hacking uh, Iran's um, nuclear plants, hacking a port, I believe, was announced last week. Uh, Israel claimed it. Iran isn't denying it. Um, the Stuxnet, where um, parts of the nuclear industry was hacked. And so, um, in terms of, for Israel, Iran is, presents itself as a rival more than a threat. And in, in this, it wants to make sure that a conflict between Iran and the US reduces the power of Iran or continued sanction and smaller levels of conflict in the Persian Gulf, in Syria, um, if you like, paralyze the capabilities of the Iranian state. I will leave it at that and come back to questions. Okay, comrades, we've had the three talks. We've got to all sorts of reasons to worry about uh, the, the friction that's ready in the Middle East to spark off into a, into increasing friction, increasing and possibly into military action. Um, so uh, it's time for people to speak. If you want to speak, um, you can put your name in the chat column or you can put your hand up like that, I suppose. Um, and I haven't got anyone at the moment. Uh, there is a way, those who are on Zoom. Beg your pardon? The, those who are on Zoom can uh, raise their hand by clicking on the participants. If you click on the participants, you can. You can, you can, you can I can't hear what you're saying clearly, Moshe. You're advising us how to uh, say we want to speak. We've got a chat column. People can say, "Can I speak?" and uh, I'll put, I'll call the next speaker. But I'm waiting for someone, <coughs> for someone to. Uh, I'm waiting for someone to uh, request the floor. Um. Yeah. Who would like to speak? Moshe, just, just, just a, a small marginal uh, remark in, in uh, uh, relation to what Yasmin has said. Uh, Hezbollah, from the Iranian point of view, is a necessary defensive mechanism. And it is, the, 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 as, far, as far as I can tell, the only really successful one. Hezbollah, it is a well-organized force which is both political and military and it is the only force that has beaten Israel at war. Israel has lost, Israel was in occupation of South Lebanon from 1982 to 2000 and it, it had to withdraw because it was beaten by Hezbollah. The, uh, um, uh, main plan for Israel to uh, uh, attack Iran is the possibility of uh, retaliation from Hezbollah, which is well armed with uh, 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 rockets and so on that can penetrate uh, quite deep into Israel and are much more effective than the puny uh, rockets that uh, Hamas uses uh, uh, from Gaza. This is the, these are these are more like fire. But uh, Hezbollah is well armed, known to be well armed and well trained, and it is a, a deterrent for Israel to uh, participate in any adventure against Iran. Okay, thank you, uh, Moshe. Um, I've got Jack Conrad. 
and uh, would please mute, mute uh, Condinard, please mute. Uh, Jack, carry on. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we got a bit of interference um, still. That's it, well done. Um, yeah, just a couple of points, first of all, in relationship to what Mike uh, was saying. Um, South China Sea. Um, if you um, look at a map of what China claims, uh, it isn't just its coastal uh, waters. It's not just a, a tiny strip. It goes way south um, down the coast of uh, North Vietnam. And um, China's been, um, still got interference by the way, Stan, that's you. That's it, thanks. Um, um, China's been intercepting Vietnamese um, fishing boats, uh, for example. So if you go to Vietnam, there's a huge government sponsored campaign uh, against China. Um, it's one of the reasons why, at least I speculated, when Obama did his, um, was it Pacific uh, pivot, um, you know, of a potential Vietnamese American uh, alliance. And there, there indeed was talk, I think, of Vietnam importing American weapons uh, at one point. And I think they didn't because it might upset China too much. Either way, I, I was really making the point, not because I'm trying to uh, uh, defend Trump or the United States, but just to point out that it has its own ambitions. It, it's far weaker, of course, uh, than the United States. Um, but it is worthwhile noting that um, um, in terms of um, uh, China, it is some sort of rival uh, to uh, the United States. I agree that at the moment, it, it, it's much of a, a more of a regional uh, rival in the sense that, uh, yeah, the United States still is claiming the right to patrol the Chinese coast where the Chinese Navy certainly isn't um, sailing off to uh, uh, police California or Florida or anything else like that. Um, so I'm just raising up uh, the role of uh, China and the fact that it is it's a very peculiar country. I wouldn't like to, uh, I don't think you just solve it by giving it a label, uh, but clearly it's, it's exporting capital, uh, not only um, to the West, uh, but also to Africa. And I think you can talk about that relationship in places like Zimbabwe being neo-colonial. Um, just in terms of what happened with the banking crisis, uh, I agree with what you're saying that the the response of the left, you know, might have begun with the anti-globalization movement, which is pathetic. Uh, but you did forget Occupy, uh, which is quite right. Maybe you're right to to forget it because again, it was so pathetic. It was a moral appeal, you know, that if you went out onto the streets, that that would somehow force um, governments and banks and institutions to do the right thing. Um, so yeah, I agree uh, that the left has had no serious um, alternative and to the extent that it has put anything forward, it's a governmental solution within the context of capitalism. So we've had Podemos, which is now in coalition government, we've had Syriza, um, we've had Communist Refoundation um, um, in Italy. And the left seems to be either of that sort, uh, i.e. a coalitionist uh, approach, or it's all about the street, the street, the street. Um, it doesn't actually have a strategic conception of uh, replacing capitalism. Um, obviously, that's a far bigger uh, task, but the left it seems to me to be trapped in the small time and the small time thinking. Um, in terms of what Moshe was saying, I found what Moshe was saying very interesting. Um, I also wanted to raise with Moshe uh, the question, okay, they've got plans to annex either short, medium term, uh, the Jordan Valley. I was going to raise with you, Moshe, um, the question of the settlements, uh, because, okay, you've got half a million 
settlers, I presume that, you know, as a rough statistic, that would include 400,000 vote, 400, voters. I presume that these people don't vote at the moment in Israeli elections. So if Netanyahu um, not only annexed um, uh, the Jordan Valley, where there were very few people, but if he annexed the settlements, uh, wouldn't that be um, annexing people who might vote Likud or parties to the right? And that would surely boost um, his um, um, coalition uh, building uh, attempts. Um, so that, that was all. So their question. Okay, who wants to speak? Don't all speak at once, come on. I just wanted to make, uh, did I hear correctly that, uh, that Jack was saying that settlers don't vote in Israeli elections? They certainly do vote in Israeli elections. I was uh, asking a question, yeah, okay, Danny, come on. Yeah, yeah, oh, right, okay. Uh, yes, they certainly do, but there are settler parties. I mean, that's what is. But yes, they do. <laughs> that's the point. Annexation will actually not change very much, uh, which is why there is a debate uh, in Israel as to whether it's a wise move or not. Uh, I have my opinion. Moshe has his. Moshe. Um, no, I, 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 was, I was going to make the same remark. Uh, settlers already do vote in the uh, Israeli elections. Uh, what, what will happen is that uh, the, the, they will now be annexed formally to Israel. It will not change their uh, status in terms of his voting, but it will greatly enhance their ability to grab more of the land around them, because that that will now be subject to the Israeli legal system, which uh, has uh, many devices, uh, which are not ap are applied at the moment in the West Bank, but are applied were applied within Israel for grabbing uh, uh, Palestinian land. I've got Laura. Laura, please. Laura, your turn, Laura. Okay. I had to unmute. Sorry, it took a while. Moshe, I wanted to ask you a question. Given um, that Netanyahu is very dependent upon American help, how or if, do you think uh, what's going on in the States now from what looks like it's going to be a fairly long-term thing, if you think this will have any effect on what Netanyahu will be able to do? Did you hear that, Moish? Yes, we heard you, Laura. Yeah, yeah, I can make an answer, yes. And obviously, yes, and I referred to it actually in my, my talk. Uh, the uh, uh, part of the drive for annexation comes precisely because uh, uh, Trump has encouraged it with uh, his uh, deal of the century, as I explained in greater detail uh, in February, in our February meeting. Yes, and, and uh, uh, whether the annexation will uh, uh, what uh, what the process will be, whether it will be full-scale annexation now in the 1st of July or just a, an enabling law uh, for annexation later on, this will depend to a large extent on uh, uh, encouragement or otherwise from Trump. For Trump, for Trump it is, the advantage is that it will it will increase his uh, popularity amongst uh, the 25% of the American electorate, which are uh, the evangelists. Uh, they, they strongly support Israeli annexation of any part of the Holy Land. 
and uh, um, if uh, uh, if Trump considers that this this is, would, would be useful for his support in the forthcoming election, then he will encourage uh, Netanyahu to go ahead, uh, irrespective and and uh, uh, perform the annexation as soon as quite soon. If for other reasons he he, he wants. Uh, to delay, then he will pressurize Netanyahu uh, not to take final steps, but only to, to enact uh, uh, a sort of enabling law, uh, enabling the annexation in principle, but not actually implementing full-scale annexation. Yes, sir. Yasemin wishes to make a point. Okay, Yasemin. Okay, I, I just wanted to make a few points about how difficult the current situation is. I mean, in some ways, uh, a lot of people have in the last few months laughed at Trump and um, we can all laugh at Trump uh, and the way he's dealt with Corona, the way he's dealing now with the um, uh, riots in US. But the problem is that irrespective of how people do say, oh, well, he's an idiot, it doesn't matter. It does matter because um, the situation is far more dangerous since he's taken power. Now, the other, however, the other point to make is that if there is one aspect of US foreign policy that isn't challenged by the majority of the Democrats, it, it is the, uh, Trump's Iran policy. And in fact, whenever it comes to something like uh, reducing the sanctions because of um, corona, anything you can think of, you, you don't get to a situation where there is any difference, there's a major, there is a major difference between the two factions. The other aspect, so the situation is dangerous irrespective of uh, um, the fact that some people say, oh, he's too much of a buffoon to start a war or uh, it's all um, rhetoric and he will never go to war. The other issue that has to be pointed out is that um, the, the absence of uh, or the unpopularity of the Islamic Republic um, for very good reasons, the fact that it's a dictatorship, the fact that it has presided over four decades of inequality becoming worse and worse, makes the prospect of some type of regime change much more likely than it did in the period where we started working in Hopi and the question of, uh, for example, at the time I think the only opposition you could talk about were opposition in exile and, and that exile opposition has gone far worse but the internal opposition to the Iranian regime is growing and in the absence of the left this will not necessarily lead to um, a, a progressive overthrow of the Islamic Republic and overthrow of the Islamic Republic from below. One of the reasons why it is important to look at the um, at poverty in Iran is that the working class has become the shantytown dwellers of 1979. The, the working class has been, um, has become the um, unemployed, the uh, person who has to do two, three jobs at the same time. Uh, and that impoverishment in itself is bad because the class has uh, been decimated. The class does not exist as a force um, such as the time of the um, overthrow of the Shah, where oil workers were um, a, a major trade, major union, major national force to exercise their um, economic and political muscle. Um, that doesn't exist. Iran has followed every rule of um, Western neoliberal capital and therefore all those companies are now small contract companies within the oil industry and there is no such a thing as a national 
uh, oil industry, so it's very difficult to organize the oil workers. Rest of the industry is completely shut down because of sanctions. No car manufacturer exists nowadays in Iran. The car manufacturing um, part of Iran's um, um, industry, of which was exporting to a lot of countries, has in practical terms, with one exception, closed down. And most of those workers are unemployed, urban poor, um, um, peddlers, dwellers, and so on. And unlike what Trump and his um, royalist Iranian allies think, sanctions actually have strengthened the Islamic Republic. They have strengthened the Islamic Republic because this is a, a, a government of clergy with close association with the bazaar, with the old bazaar, the market in Iran. And that association has always relied on the black economy, on um, dealers, deals under the table. That top side of the economy is thriving. This is the rulers have access to uh, a different exchange rates than ordinary people. They can have the monopoly of distribution. They have the monopoly of commerce. So the rulers and their close allies and their close associates are the beneficiaries of sanctions where they can monopolize black market. So contrary to what um, Trump and uh, the Iranian. Even more, if you think Trump is stupid, you should meet his Iranian allies amongst Iranian royalists. But both of these two are extremely uh, mistaken if they think that sanctions will bring down the Iranian government. It has weakened it, but clearly its survival, especially after the last three years, is proof that the Islamic government can uh, find ways of overcoming sanctions. Bringing gold from Venezuela is probably not the brightest of the ideas they've come up with uh, in exchange for the five tankers that traveled half of the world to get to Venezuela, but there are hundreds of other ways in which they have uh, managed to survive for their own benefit, but yet at the expense of poverty and destitution for the majority of the population. I don't have any other takers at the moment. If anybody wants to speak, they can. Um, or that also applies to the panel speakers. Mike can speak. Okay, Mike. Okay. Carry on, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just a quick response to John's point about China. Um, I, I agree that the Chinese claims in the South China Sea look pretty exorbitant. Um, but uh, the, the, my point is not I, the, the Chinese claims in the South China Sea, but Chinese claims in the East China Sea. And in this context, uh, the uh, United States uh, insists on controlling the waters between uh, China and Taiwan, um, and uh, between uh, China and Korea, China and Japan, that um, these this stuff is uh, uh, still going on, and we have going along with this, of course, which I hadn't noticed. I hadn't noticed. There's a BBC report on it a couple of days ago. Um, border tension between uh, China and India over Ladakh. Uh, and uh, the BBC report actually helpfully prints the map and turns out this China-India tension over Ladakh is connected to Belt and Road and Chinese trade relations with the possibility of Indian action to interrupt Chinese trade relations with Pakistan. Uh, and the connection, there is a connection also with the Indian removal of autonomy from uh, Indian administered Kashmir. Uh, which is sort of pushing in the direction of uh, India can move northwards uh, against uh, uh, the uh, land border between uh, um, uh, China and Pakistan. Um, so, I, 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 my my point then is not that um, 
the Chinese are making uh, un perfect, that the Chinese are reasonable in relation to there. What they've done is annex a whole load of um, sandbars and put buildings on them in order to make uh, very large uh, South China Sea. But of course, the uh, Western, predominantly Western media, emphasizes the disputes over the South China Sea in order to shut out altogether the disputes over uh, the East China Sea, uh, which are much more uh, ambiguous from the point of view of the United States claims and uh, claims that the United States is allied. Um, the other one I I did mention Occupy, I, I, but, I, but probably too quickly. I just said that Occupy was so feeble by comparison with uh, 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 the um, uh, social forums movement that um, <coughs> uh, it, it sort of pointed more clearly in the direction of the ascendancy of the nationalist right because it was didn't go anywhere. It was just a flash in the pan, um, which I think is uh, um, uh, 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 very clear. Um, I flag, I don't actually think the United States is about to launch a war with China because it's nuclear armed. But um, uh, at the same time, there's a sort of, uh, endless ratchet of American aggression at the edges through proxy operations, through um, sanctions operations, through et cetera, et cetera. The end of which would be will be uh, that people do come to the conclusion that um, uh, the only morally justifiable thing to do is to drop the bomb. Or to get global uh, is global generalized nuclear exchange on the basis that you have a choice between die on your feet and die on your knees. Um, which the United States is increasingly insisting not on die on your feet and live on your knees or live on your knees, but die on your feet or die on your knees. And that, in a sense, is the situation in Iran as well. There's no obvious uh, what concessions and point that Yasmin made, what concessions could the Iranians make which would lead the American United States to stop wishing to destroy the Iranian state? It's very clear. The United States doesn't just want to overthrow the Islamic Iranian Islamic Republic. It wants to uh, break up, to separate out as Azerbaijan, to separate out uh, Baluchistan, to separate out um, Kazakhstan, uh, to partition the uh, I I Iranian state. So th th this, 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 um, which I think this stuff is in a sense, it's a. It's a, in a sense a decline of the United States as a world hegemon, but it's not a decline in the sense that the world hegemon has got less power. It's that it uses and has done really ever since its defeat in Vietnam. It, it's used its power, the power which it continues to have with increasing irration, irrationality so as to impose destruction on the rest of the world. That's it. Okay, I've got a question from Jack Conrad for Moshe. Jack. Yeah, thanks for that, Mike. I did miss uh, Occupy. I must have sort of, what's the word, um, switched not, off for a second. Not worth <laughs> it's to. worthwhile forgetting, I admit it. Yeah. Okay, Moshe, I just wanted to ask you a question because, um, uh, okay, you showed the picture of uh, Netanyahu coming in to his trial. Um, if you look at or you listen to his um, uh, acceptance speech it did strike me as uh, as a mu as a much electioneering um, as it did uh, a promise uh, to go ahead with the last chat not the last uh, the next glorious chapter of Zionism uh, isn't it noticeable that uh, Gantz who I think uh, was sworn in after Netanyahu, who made no reference to annexation, even though, if I, my understanding is right, all the members of the coalition are signed up to Trump's deal of the century. In other words, is Netanyahu, having got together his uh, coalition, having guaranteed his get out of jail card for three years, is he still um, 
maneuvering um, against Gantz and against other parties. Uh, in other words, is the stuff about annexation as much electioneering as anything else? And isn't electioneering, as you already referred to it, um, about him keeping out of jail? Uh, no, I don't think that he needs uh, a, a, an election. Although you know he's a he's a, a, a classical you know a master schemer, so he's got several alternative plans. Uh, I don't think he needs um, um, an election right now. He's got Gantz well sort of uh, under control. He has made such such a, 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 a schmatte out of him that uh, you know <laughs> to, to use the uh, classical idiom. I mean, is 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 just a, a, a nothing. Is is capitulated so much, uh, having you know uh, founded the party uh, uh, dedicated to unseating Netanyahu. And now he's, he, he does as, as he's told. And Netanyahu has got him well under control. Uh, Netanyahu has got <clears throat> several alternative schemes. Uh, first of all, you know, th this, this trial can go on and on. He has already secured legislation unprecedented. You see, in Israel, uh, the, the, there is a standing law that a minister cannot serve when uh, he or she is uh, 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 sub uh, 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 subject to injunction, uh, uh, never mind, you know, convicted. Uh, the, uh, Netanyahu has secured the uh, remarkable uh, result that now under the, the latest uh, uh, decision of the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, this rule that a minister cannot serve when in, uh, under injunction doesn't apply to the prime minister. Uh, you figure it out. So, uh, 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 and then, moreover, he has secured also an agreement with Gantz, and that is a formal part of the formal coalition agreement, that if he is convicted uh, by the court, he can still go on serving, so long as uh, uh, he, it's, he can, he is under appeal, and surely uh, uh, it is very likely that he is going to be convicted. But then he can appeal, and you can you can work out how many years it will take for the appeal to to be heard. It's a question of years and years and years. Long before that, Netanyahu is planning to uh, arrange for him when when his. Uh, a, a rotation agreement with Gantz comes to fruition, not to serve as an alternate prime minister, but to serve as president of Israel, because by that time, the, the uh, presidential uh, uh, term will come to an end. And one of his options is to uh, serve as uh, Israel president. He may still be <clears throat> under litigation because the, the, the uh, 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 appeal will take many years and you know this is this is uh, reminiscent of the the old jewish joke about about the, the jew who promised the polish nobleman who whose steward he was to teach his horse to speak and the friends of the the jew came to him and said how can you promise such a thing he said well i I, I, I asked him to give me seven years. In seven years, either the nobleman will die or the horse will die, or maybe, you know, uh, even I will die. So, well, you know, don't, don't worry about it. So this is, this is the, the situation with Netanyahu. He has nothing now, he has nothing really to worry about, especially since he has now secured a, 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 a real climate of terror in, in, in Israel against the, the his so-called <laughs> persecutors, the, the legal system, the attorney general, uh, 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 and anyone who, who does oppose him, wh whom he qualified as left. There's no left in Israel. Nothing, the, the, there's nothing left of the left, in, in the, as, a, except you know, the, the very uh, small uh, 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 united uh, uh, list of, of mainly Arab parties, and the extra parliamentary is very tiny 
uh, anti-Zionist left. I mean, in, in the major part of the Israeli spectrum, there is the, the, the left has, you know, disappeared. The Labour Party is no longer. It's now part of his coalition. The Israeli Labour Party used to rule Israel, is now part of his coalition. He has nothing really to, to worry about. If need be, uh, he, he will uh, 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 provoke an election if, I mean, he has done it three times. So, but I think now he feels enough is enough. He has got what he, what he wanted. Uh, his uh, 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 staying out of jail is secured for the next uh, five, six years, uh, at least. And, and then we shall see if we leave so long. Uh, Yasmin, uh, your turn. I have a couple of questions, uh, mainly as uh, things Moshe maybe not. Um, the Jewish population of Iran, of those who stayed in Iran um, after 1979, are very clear that they oppose um, any threat of war. And in fact, um, very successive Zionist governments have failed to encourage them to move to Israel. Um, this is quite clear if you look at the interviews and so on. What I was wondering was of the Iranian populations that did emigrate to Israel, especially near 1979 or during the Iran-Iraq war, are they happy with a war? Would they be the, or I suppose it's a difficult question, but do the reports show them being um, like some of the royalists in Los Angeles, um, keen on regime change so they could go back? Or is it the report they've given of Israel and second class citizenship or whatever that is deterring their relatives in Iran to move to Israel? So that's one question. And the next one is about the Islamic Republic's support for Palestinian groups. Now, I know that there is a jihad Islami that Iran finances and supports. What I don't know is how significant they are as a force. I know that contrary to the propaganda put forward, not just by uh, the US and uh, Saudi Arabian broadcasters, uh, but also by the Palestinian authorities, there is always this claim that Iran supports Hamas or has supported Hamas. From what I know, um, that's more in terms of um, the leadership of Hamas, financial support for the maintenance of leadership of Hamas. And what has happened there is that there's big gaps like this during the Syrian uh, civil war. Am I right or am I simplifying this issue? It's Moshe. If you want, Moshe. Yeah. Uh, uh, as, as to the first question, it's very difficult to tell. I mean, the, the, the uh, 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 population in Israel of Iranian origin is, is, is uh, 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 divided by class. Uh, the, the older uh, uh, immigration, uh, which occurred right, you know, after the Second World War, were mainly, you know, poor people, uh, or, or even before that, there were, there, there were uh, poor people. Um, then, then uh, after the Khomeini uh, uh, regime came to power, uh, a lot of wealthy uh, Jewish people uh, left Iran. Uh, so it, it's very difficult to generalize. It depends on, on how long they are in Israel and, and, and also on class. Uh, but my general impression is by and large, the, uh, the uh, uh, Jews in Israel of Iranian origin are very patriotic about Iran. First of all, first of all, you you must realize that uh, uh, Persia is is the good guy in in in, in Jewish uh, uh, historical conception. The the, the 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 Greeks are the baddies. I mean, Greeks following the, uh, the disintegration of the Alexander the Great uh, Empire. Uh, they are the, they are the baddies, and the, and the Persians are the goodies. And they were the goodies, you know, since since biblical times. So the, there, is, the, there is this sentiment, and and 
uh, uh, there is a, a, a lot of sort of uh, nostalgia and patriotism, irrespective. I think a, a lot of Iranian Jews in, in, in Israel would, would, would uh, find it very regrettable if there was a war uh, uh, against, between Israel and Iran, especially as they have relatives who, who uh, stayed behind and stayed behind for, you know, good reasons, you know, sort of, uh, uh, except for the uh, uh, very rich people of, of Iranian origin who are doing very well. I mean, the, the, in general, the, the uh, uh, Jews of Iranian origin are not uh, doing, you know, extremely well. They're not part of the, uh, although uh, a, 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 a past president of Israel was uh, of Iranian origin. By the way, he ended up in prison. Uh, for for uh, sexual offenses, uh, Katsav was was his name. Um, so I mean, uh, uh, there is no uniform answer to that. But a lot of them, I think, would feel would feel uh, uh, sorry and 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 uh, 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 would regret and and be unhappy about about the war with, with Iran, who for for which they they retain a lot of a lot of uh, positive sentiments. As for Islamic Jihad, Islamic Jihad, I, I, uh, the, the, first of all, it, 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 Islamic Jihad is, is a very ineffectual uh, uh, organization that, that creates trouble for Hamas um, and uh, uh, does not have you know, much uh, support among the, the population of, of Gaza. They are, they are, uh, they are you know, uh, more, more sort of the, in terms of, of their propaganda, they sometimes pressurize Hamas to become more militant. But I mean, they, they their success is to give Israel excuses for devastating uh, uh, attacks against uh, uh, the Gaza Strip. I mean, the whole the whole thing, you know, of the armed struggle of of uh, uh, both Hamas and and Islamic Jihad is really counterproductive. As opposed to Hezbollah, Hezbollah, Hezbollah uh, military stance against Israel is very successful and, and uh, uh, it's not, not a joke. In the case of Hamas and, and uh, uh, Islamic Jihad, there, there does not exist the, the condition for successful guerrilla war. And so their so-called armed struggle is, is, in my view, completely uh, 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 counterproductive. As far as, as uh, aid is concerned, their, their main uh, uh, financial uh, help comes from the Gulf, not from, not from uh, Iran, but from Qatar. So, uh, I mean, they, they do get, I mean, there, there is a, a sort of a subsidy which Israel allows to enter in order for, you know, to prevent the whole situation of Gaza from exploding in, in, in an uncontrollable way. They allow a subsidy from from the Gulf state. I think it's mainly Qatar, uh, which which goes you know into the Gaza Strip. It also allows Israel uh, because because it depends on Israeli uh, uh, permission for the funds to to go into Gaza. So it, it gives Israel another way of controlling the situation in Gaza. If you if you don't behave well, if you use you know throw, uh, use too many rockets. Then we'll shut off your your uh, subsidy from the Gulf. Okay, comrades. I think uh, unless uh, somebody wants to speak, they can. But uh, we've been on for an hour and three quarters. Um, is it enough? Perhaps it's enough. Any parting remarks from panelists? No. Are we all right? Okay. Okay, let's uh, say goodbye. And next week, comrades, next week will be a report from the uh, political report.